A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. recently at a local alcohol and drug recovery center, and I do it a couple times a year for a month, one hour per week. And recently in October when I taught, it was on the four steps to a healthy relationship. And it never fails that after each class, one or two or more people come up and they say, I wish I'd have known this stuff. Nobody told me. I didn't know. When I look back at the trail of wreckage my life has been, I just wished I would have known. And you know what? I echo that in my own life. And you know what I can tell them is what I can tell you. You can know. You can know because it's in the book of Proverbs, many other places, but it's in the book of Proverbs. What do I mean by that? Tremendous wisdom on how to have a healthy relationship and what leads us astray. So we're in our series on wisdom for healthy relationships and this morning, we're going to talk about controlling my words reduces pain and grows relational health. See, we have guideposts, things that are great for us to do. We ought to pay attention to and build into our lives. Then we have guardrails, and the rail's there for a reason. I used to live in the Sierras. I'm thankful for guardrails. You get a long drop, you don't have a guardrail. And the Bible provides both of those in the book of Proverbs. And so last week, Pastor Sean talked about self-control, how important that is. And you know why it's in the Bible so often? Old Testament all the way through the New is the self, the self that we each have, needs to be controlled. This is a broken world, and we're broken people, and if the self just runs wild, we're going to cause trouble and cause pain to ourselves and others. We just are, so it has to be controlled. So in the book of Proverbs, God provides both guideposts that are positive and healthy, directives, and guardrails that prevent destruction and pain. So we're going to look at both this morning, guideposts and guardrails, and what, what is God calling us to? So I've, I've selected some Proverbs that we're going to take a look at. There are so many more than just the ones you're going to see and hear this morning. I want you to know that you're free to Look at Proverbs on your own, walk all the way through it, find your own. Maybe you already have them in your mind, but these are the ones that, that I just feel like he gave to me. And we're gonna look at them. And first, we're gonna talk about words of wisdom found in Proverbs, guideposts, that bless us. So let's walk through it. Proverbs 16, verses 23 and 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So what does that mean? It means gracious Words are kind and pleasant. They warm us up. And when I saw the word honeycomb, I got derailed for a moment. When I was a kid, we'd go to Sears and Robux about once a month to look at stuff we couldn't afford, and it was a lot of fun. But the big treat was at the end, if we were good enough and we were watching ourselves, we would get a chunk of chocolate-covered honeycomb. You want to hit your pleasure uh, receptors in your brain? That's all I could think of. I had to slowly work through that and get back to the Bible. Does anybody know where you can find some of that, by the way? <laughs> but words are like that, aren't they? Sweet, and they soothe us, and they salve our, our wounds. They're just beautiful. And then we move to Proverbs 25, verse 11. This is so poetic and lyrical. Like golden apples set in silver is a word spoken at the right time. You ever have that experience where this word that you just said or this phrase you said to somebody the moment you said it, you went, man, that's good. And you could see any other person like, that was good. And you wished you could do it every time, but you can't. And then somebody does it with you. That's the right word or phrase spoken at the right time and the right way. Proverb, Proverbs tells us how powerful that can be. Proverbs 18, verse 21. This is really important. We have to hear this. The tongue has the power of life and death. All those who love it will eat its fruit. Fruit 
biblically means sweet and savory and tastes good. And we want the way that we use our tongue, the way that we communicate, be sweet and savory and taste good to us as the senders and to others as the receivers. But more importantly, it has the power of life and death. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. Proverbs 17, verse 27, the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. And whoever has understanding is even tempered. So in this case, the use of the word knowledge, what it means there is you have something you want to say and you know what it's going to do when you say it. You know, you've been around, you've been through this before, you have experience, you know these people, and sometimes we say it anyway. We just do. And in those cases, it hurts, and it can bring destruction. We are called to use restraint. We are called to be calm enough to know that the delivery of words has great Power. And in the moment, sometimes we got to figure out how to calm ourselves down so we can get to using the right knowledge of how we communicate. So Proverbs also gives us guardrails, foolish words that pierce and ruin, pierce and ruin. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 tells us that the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless often means reactive, without thought, without weighing the outcome. It's sort of instinctive, reactive. It happened in the moment. But wisdom says, slow that train down. Think it through. Do you really want this outcome? You know, I have to say, sometimes in relationships, we do. If we're hurt, sometimes we just want to hurt. It's natural, but it isn't biblical, and it's not godly. That's the hard part. So if we are hurt, and we want to say something that hurts back, you know what? Go ahead, and you'll reap what you sow. Any of us will. So then it goes on to say in Proverbs, more guardrails, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So sometimes we're in an interaction relationally where someone's angry at us and we feel it, you know, it's coming at us and we want to ramp up to match it and that's natural. And if you do it though, you can expect no good to come of it. In general, it will cause more harm than any microscopic good we might find. Moving on, Proverbs 25, verse 18, like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow is one who gives false testimony against a neighbor. We can use our words and communications to tell an untruth about a situation or someone else. It's deceit, and however it's done, it may be because I want to reduce consequences for my behavior. I don't want to be held accountable. I'm angry. I want to paint someone in a bad light. I want to hurt or harm them. But the Bible says you can't do it. Those come out of this also, out of our mouth, our words and the phrases. And we have to just look at that and stop. And we're going we're gonna to tackle an old saying from folklore this morning. And I'm going to bust it all up as the myth that it is. There is a saying first appearing in the U.S. anywhere written. In 1862, a quote appeared in a church publication called the Christian Recorder. And it is called there an old adage. What that means is they may have recorded it here, but it had been going on for a lot longer prior to that time. And here it is. And if you know this, I want you to finish it with me. Sticks and stones may break bones. But words will never hurt me. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. If you're willing to, raise your hand. How many here this morning have heard this in your life? That's the whole group. How many of, it, of you have had it said to you by parents, grandparents, or other family members? All right. This, don't raise your hands, but how many have said it to others? yourself. It's, you know. He knows. You know. This may be hard to hear, but I'm going to bust it up. It's a lie. It isn't true. 
It's just not true. It's not biblical. It doesn't work. It can't work. I understand it's well-intentioned, but it's misleading in this regard. It's misleading in that it's not doable. It, we can't do it. We can't somehow create a self or a presentation that says, I don't care what anybody ever says to me about anything. Really? When that is said, you can almost always count on this person being so wounded, so hurt, somewhere in their life, they're just not going to let it happen anymore. So they've created a safeguard or a defense. But it's rarely ever really true about anyone. So let's look at what else the Bible says about relationships. Proverbs is in the Old Testament. Let's look at what James says in the New Testament. In James chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, he says this, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, sailed in those days, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Now, this struck close to home because three or four weeks ago, I spent three days out in the far Channel Islands on a dive boat. And it's a heavy boat. It's only 65 feet, but it's got dive gear people and a lot of gear on. It's a heavy boat. But fortunately, the ocean was really calm during that trip. And so we were able to go to the windward side of Santa Cruz Island, the biggest of the outer islands. And on that windward side, because of the forces of nature, there are some of the largest sea caves in the world. And in one particular sea cave called Painted Cave, Captain Eric, who I've known for 20 years, will take that boat all the way into the mountain in this cave, this big old boat. We just have this much room on each side. And the newbies are all freaked out like, ah, you know, it's so fun to watch them more than the cave itself. I've seen the cave. But you know what's really fun for me, and I did it this last trip, is I went up to the next deck and I watched Eric do this. He's up there with just this much panel in front of him, switches, thrusters, side, wheel, thrusters, side. It's all he's doing, just a little switch. And this big old boat is maneuvering perfectly into this cave. And then he backs it out. And that's what I see here. A very small rudder takes it where the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great buzz. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. So many of you have watched the news in the last several weeks and seen all this destruction that came with these fires, wildfires. The latest uh, large one was the Kincaid fire, and I was watching it with live video updates one morning, and I noticed from cameras way up high that they showed how these winds were howling across the landscape and moving this fire. And if you saw the big picture, there was a line of smoke burned here and then moving this way. But way over here was miles and miles of brush that was not burning. But the same wind was blowing across it. Why wasn't it burning? There had not been a spark. You see what it's saying here? That spark. Sometimes we think it's the conditions that make me speak well and in a helpful way, and it isn't. It's more than that. It's our tongue. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among parts of the body, James goes on to say. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Is he making his point? Hell, fire, all of that. I think we're making the point here. He goes on to say in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. I'd never really camped on that part before, made in God's likeness. You might be familiar with the Latin term imago Dei. It means image of God. What the scripture tells us is every human being is imago Dei, made, created in the image of God, so that when we curse people, we're cursing a creation of the Holy Father. I never really thought about it, but hopefully it raises the bar a little bit. This isn't just a person that we have this immediate opinion of. It's a creation created in his image. So words absolutely can and do hurt us. 
And they can easily sabotage healthy relationships. So let's go back to sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt us. So I thought about that. Sticks and stones, words. Sticks and stones, words. If you're anything like me, I've been hurt by sticks and stones. When I was a kid, we had rock wars. How many of you had rock wars? Oh, good, because maybe I thought for a while it was only me. Um, it's not, apparently. But hurt with sticks, playing swords or anything, or you know, just playing around. And what do you get? Sometimes a broken bone, a cut, a bruise. But what happens to those? They heal. God, in his mercy, created a body that heals. But I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people that have mentioned words and things said to them eons ago, it seems like, and it still just hurts. If they think about it or it comes up, it's like, oh. I had someone tell me when I distributed a survey I'm going to share with you, they, they said, I can't even do the survey. Why? Just starting to write a word that hurt me brings it all up. And this is a pretty grounded person. I, w I was surprised by that. So again, how many of you would say this morning that words or phrases used with you throughout the years from birth to now have hurt you? And again, how many of you know that you've used words that have hurt others? Don't show it. Don't raise your hands. You don't have to. I already know. <laughs> Whatever. I, it's, I did, I did. I, you know, thinking about this, I don't even want to list all the things I've said that I wished I hadn't said in my life, but one incident really popped out. When I thought about words have this power and they impact and guide, my daughter Megan was seven years old and she wouldn't sleep. She never slept through the night until she was seven. For whatever reason, she just didn't. And so sometimes it was hard because she'd come out of her room after she was asleep. I would read to her every night. We have this very special bond. Today, even, she calls me poppies. But one particular night, she just wouldn't sleep, and I was tired. I'd been working. I was just exhausted. You know, I just didn't have it, whatever the reason is. Good night, honey. Good night, poppies. She gets up again. I, I can't take it. I can't not sleep. All that to say, she came out of her room. I opened the door, and I said, get back in that bed. What is the matter with you? And I got to tell you, I, it doesn't really matter that I was tired. You know, I said, oh, it doesn't really matter. I will never forget the look on her face. She was terrorized by the safest person in her world. Terrorized. It affected her for a long time. I regret having said that. And I won't hide behind, well, you know, everybody does it. No, I could have done better. And I want to do better. I also had something else said to me growing up by my folks. God bless them. I don't think they'd know a parenting book if it dropped out of the sky and hit them on the head. <laughs> my dad's gone, but my mom would chuckle if she was here. They would say, you know, you seem smart, but you just don't have any common sense. <laughs> want a sandwich? <laughs> like that wasn't going to go in. <laughs> it went right in. Years later, I'm living in the Sierras, and I'm married, and I got a Rambler station wagon. Raise your hand if you had a Rambler. <laughs> okay, I am alone. Oh, Jim, thank you. We'll talk after. <laughs> I hear this noise. The car stops moving, and the rear end has a clunk in it. And I, a neighbor, I only lived there a few months. I didn't know anybody in this town of Sonora. A neighbor said, that eh, sounds like your rear end. I said, oh, that's not good. I have no money and no common sense. So I don't know what's going to happen. And he said, well, you got to get another rear end. I said, so where do you get those? I'd never seen a rear end store. <laughs> so he told me, you go to a junkyard in Modesto and you find one. I said, they would have one there? Sure enough, they did. And I brought it back. And I take it out. I had him help me unload it. And I used a friend's truck and there it is on the ground. I'm going, okay, so there's one of these under there. And that one has to come out and this one has to go in. It took me four, five, six days to do it. I just did it really slow. And I learned something about myself. Maybe I'm not fast at learning, but I do learn. No, but that common sense thing went with me right up to that time where I had no other options and I had to confront it. Maybe you have something like that that was said to you in your life that still kind of hums along in there.
So we did a survey with the staff, Shoreline staff, and the Shoreline leadership team. And we asked them, would you be willing to list for us words spoken to you from zero to now and phrases that have hurt you and really been troubling to you? And on the other side of the sheet, would you be willing to list words spoken to you from zero to now that blessed you and encouraged you and kind of lit you up? They said, yes, and I got a list, an extensive list. And I did some anecdotal interviews as well. And I want to share with you these lists. And the first list is a hard list to share. I hope it's hard for you to hear. It's awful. It really is awful. And you're going to feel bad, and I hope you do. I mean that. It should. Let me just go through these harmful words and phrases that are real in people's lives that were actually said. Number one, you're crazy. You are so broken. You're just not good enough. I don't have time for you. I'm too tired. We don't want you here. Because I said so. You are so stupid. I didn't want you there. That's why I didn't invite you. You'll never be able to do that. Not you. You're worthless. You're ugly. I don't trust you to do the right thing. I just don't. We don't need your ideas. What were you thinking? Were you even thinking? You're lazy. You're self-centered. You're just not needed. You are prideful and arrogant. You aren't a leader. You're just not qualified for this. And that wasn't good enough. It just wasn't good enough. So this should hurt. We should feel this because these words do great damage. The Bible speaks to it. Our experience lives it out. And many of us still have those words lingering inside. And it really is hard when we're young because on what basis would a little kid like me when my parents say, you have no common sense, on what basis would I say, yeah, huh? <laughs> yes, I do. You don't know. You just soak it up and it becomes your reality, doesn't it? And it can still happen as adults. I wish it stopped at age 8, 9, 10, or 12, but it doesn't. It goes on. So we have another list. This is the other list. What kinds of things were blessings to you? Words that were said or phrases that were said. And I really like this list. I always want to take a shower after the first list. It's like, ah, check this out. You're so joyful. I love you. I'm here for you. You are so good at that. And I'm glad you're here. I see the light of Jesus in you. You are such a blessing. You are smart. You're friendly. You know, you're caring and you have a genuine heart. You are kind and compassionate. You're generous. You're considerate. You're loving. You're selfless and courageous. I believe in you. And here's what I like to say to my wife who's right here. You make me a better person, because she does. She makes me a better person. You ease my burdens. I see so much potential in you. You know, you really use your gifts for God's glory. You are so thoughtful. I appreciate your work and your talents. I'm proud of you. I look up to you. You are unique and special. You can be anything you want to be. You really can. I hope that that list feels way different from the first list. These are real things. 
So that's what, so let me tell you what I turned something around for me. I got a blessing when I was at Northern Arizona University, the school I went to, because no school in California would accept me, and any of you just didn't care. And so when I went to school there, I entered the School of Sociology because I asked people, what class should I take? And I think they deduced from that very question that I probably shouldn't go into science. So they said, why don't you take sociology? So I had intro to sociology with Dr. Margaret Estes, and she was brilliant. And I'm in the class with, like, I don't know, 60, 70 other people going, I love this stuff. And about four or five weeks in, she looks right at me. She goes, you know what? You're smart. You're a smart guy. I didn't know what to do with that. You know why? Because I didn't pay her to say it. If I'd have known she would have taken pay to say it, I might have paid her, but I didn't. And... I didn't know her. She didn't know my history. She didn't know anything about me. I didn't solicit it. I didn't ask her to say it. It wasn't the time in class when you say nice things. It just came out of nowhere. I had no way to defend it. <laughs> I walked out going, what the heck was that? <laughs> it was truth. I learned, I went on to do well in school, and I learned I wasn't stupid. But I did have comments. Of, Thank you, Dr. Margaret. Estes. So what do we do now? We talked about guideposts and guardrails. Guideposts, great things, wisdom found in the Proverbs that tell us how to do wonderful things and what God has for us in relationships and guardrails, which keep us from destruction and ruin and being pierced. What do we do? In your bulletin, you're going to see something. There's two lists. These are also on the Shoreline app. And what I want you to consider is what I'm going to ask you to do next. We're going to read this proverb again. I'm going to read it for you. Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Would you please take these bulletins home? And in that list, and I just really want to call you to this, in that first list, you're going to write down if, I mean if, five words or phrases that you use and abuse that hurt others. You're gonna write them down. And you're gonna post that list, keep it in your wallet, purse, fridge, car seat. And you're gonna commit, here it comes, to never use them again. Never again, never. Do better isn't good enough. Never use them again. I mean, if the words have the power of life and death, we gotta take it seriously. Never use them again. You'll notice another list under there, and it's based on Proverbs 16, 23, 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. Now, to this list, you would write five words or phrases that will bless others. Either they're ones you already use, just keep going, but write them down. But if they're new ones you can think of that you occasionally use, write them down, and you commit to using those daily. Daily. I want you to really take this to heart. It's so important. And then at the end of one week, track your progress and observe any changes. There should be some changes. Not just in others and the relationship, but changes in you. It feels different to have honeycomb come out than it does to have acid and vinegar come out. The sender will feel different. I want you to know we can do this. We can learn to use our words to build, sustain, and grow healthy relationships. And for many, this seems overwhelming or impossible. Dennis, I've never done it. It's not my style. You don't understand in my family. This is how we talk. This is how we do it. I'll say, okay, I accept all that. I understand all that. But it's got to be biblical because the greatest source of wisdom about health in relationships is Scripture, not what I think on any given day. And, you know, I've been a therapist, a licensed therapist, forever, 37 years. And new books on how to be in a relationship, how to communicate, how to do things in good and healthy ways come out every day. And they're all derivative, I can say this. They're all derivative from Proverbs and biblical wisdom. I haven't seen anything new, like shocking. New book comes out, wipes out everything, all ancient wisdom that came before, and now Bob Smith wrote a book. It's not true. It's all there. We can do this, but we need this. We need Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul wrote that in prison, 
But we need to know that in verses 10 to 13, he uses the word learn twice. He says, I've learned to be content. Then again, he goes, I've learned the secret of being content. Why did he say learn? It means he didn't know it at one point. He did not know how to do that. It just didn't come with his character and his personality. Paul had to focus and learn, and he learned. If he can learn, we can learn. He said, I can do it through him who gives me strength. We can do it through him who gives us strength. Amen? Amen. Trust him. Read his word. Commit to change your words and work on it every day. He will not disappoint you. Give it time. Give it time. But don't try it. I just don't even like the word. Do it. Do what it calls us to. I'm going to do that. I'm doing that. I want to do this. Let's do it together. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you that we don't have to grasp and wonder and be confused and wander down every path, to know what it is to do healthy things in a relationship, wise things. We can follow your guideposts, Father. We can learn from your guardrails. We can learn from your Proverbs. Help us learn. You know each one of us in here today, Lord. You know what we've said to anybody in our life right up to this moment. You know what's been said to us. Father, intervene. As Paul said, intervene because you have strength we don't have in every person's heart and mind right here tonight, or today, mine included, to make it different, to help it be different. We trust your Holy Spirit to provide, and we pray this in the precious name of the one who leads us, commanded us, and loves us best, Jesus Christ. Everyone together said, amen. Amen. So thank you for coming today. I want to give you a few announcements. One, if you're new or recent, or you want to know more about what we do as a church, go to the Connection Center straight across the lobby. Talk to Patty, talk to the team in there. You'll get a gift. You'll get ideas and information about what we do as a church, how to get connected and be in the family to a greater depth than maybe you are now. Also, if you want prayer, we love to pray. We'll have people coming up front. And at this cross right over here, we have anointing oil. If you, if you want to be anointed with oil for healing, please do. It's biblical. It's found in the book of James. And now before you go, I want to share something with you here. I want to give you a visual. Remember the proverb that said, apple of gold set in silver. Would you look at this, and as you leave, decide that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my words an apple of gold set in silver, as opposed to the hammer. Take a look at this. If you've been using the hammer, can I encourage you to put the hammer away and have the apple of gold set in silver. God bless. Let's go do this together. Have a terrific day.